Well, we've seen what grieving looks like in Philadelphia over Kobe Bryant. We have seen last night the city all lit up in purple and yellow, something I never thought I would see in Philadelphia on the uh, you know skyscraper lights and everything like that. We've also seen in Philadelphia sort of what it looks like in L.A. from scenes at the Spectre or the Staples Center, I mean, uh, some late night hosts and Jimmy Kimmel and Jimmy Fallon sharing their own anecdotes. But to really deliver the scene of what life is like in L.A. right now, not just a few people, not just a few snippets, but what life is like going on right now in Los Angeles. We bring in Om Young Misik. He covers the Lakers, the Clippers, the NBA for ESPN, does an amazing job. I've known him for a long time, and uh, we're happy to bring you on, Om. Give us kind of an idea of what things are like right now in L.A. when you're when you're out and about and seeing people uh, kind of collaborating on the streets, whether it's at the the uh, Staples Center or around and about. What, what What's life like? Uh, it's, it's really hard to describe. It just seems like there's kind of like a, like a pall over everyone here in Los Angeles. Uh, it's like, um, you know, I, I, when I landed, I was, I was in Philadelphia with the Lakers on Saturday night when LeBron passed Kobe. And then I flew back. The team stayed overnight because it was such a late flight. I flew back, landed late around 1030 and just felt like a need to go out to Staples Center in LA Live to just kind of see people out there and see all the tributes and everything. Mm -hmm. And even after like almost nearly one o'clock in the morning, there were still several people out in this, basically the center of LA live. And there's about four makeshift memorials of like candle, candle lights and, and basically um, jerseys, oversized teddy bears with Kobe's Jersey on it um, pictures. And you would just see people just kind of like wandering around and, and, unable to talk or some other people were like sharing Kobe stories. Um, you know, there was like boys to men so hard to say goodbye to yesterday playing and, and puff daddy, I'll be missing you. And in the background and then every now and then Kobe chance to break out. And that's like almost like one, one o'clock in the morning, uh, in an, in a place where a lot of people go to bed early because Californians, I think, you know, I'm an East coast guy, but I've been out here now for three years. People like to get up early here. And uh, there were still people out there just kind of wandering around. And then yesterday, last night, my colleague Dave McMenamin was out there late late at night, and there was hundreds of people packed, chanting Kobe, um, chanting MVP, and still just kind of like wandering around not in disbelief. I think everybody out here is still shocked, uh, and it's going to take a while to kind of get over it. And there's little makeshift tributes and, and memorials to Kobe around the city, whether it's at, you know, murals that street artists have painted on the wall or at the Lakers practice facility in El Segundo, uh, it's just going to take a long time for people to get over this. And you didn't need to know Kobe Bryant at all. In fact, many people didn't know him at all, but they all felt connected to him in some way because they grew up watching him from a boy to a man. They went through all the ups and downs, through all the turmoil off the court to the championships, and then – Seeing him as a father, I think that's the thing that has really shaken a lot of people is he started to give people a glimpse into his life of him and his daughters, especially Gigi. And that's the thing that a lot of people were having a hard time coping with. Yeah, no doubt. Um, you were in Philadelphia and didn't give me a call. So when we get off the air, we're going to have to talk about that. I don't think that that can happen again. Um, but <laughs> to go back I to been at the arena, bud. That was I know I should have been there, man. I should have. But um I got to ask you this because the game being canceled tonight, the Lakers and the Clippers were supposed to play. They canceled the game out here. You've heard some say, well, it's surprising that they would do that. Kobe would want them to play. And I've wondered if this decision wasn't made per se based on the players, but on what's going on outside the, the uh, arena and just the people of fans and of Los Angeles, not really being able to stomach basketball at the moment. Actually, I think uh, some people, you know, I think maybe L.A. might have welcomed that game just so that it would help them perhaps, uh, you know, take that next step in the morning process. But let me just say this organization, the Lakers organization, I, don't, I just don't think was any – was capable and ready to play this game that quickly. Hmm. The Lakers team found out um, that Kobe had passed while on their team flight back from Philadelphia, and everybody was shook. And 
from the moment they landed, this, the, or, the entire organization, I'm not even just talking about the players. There are staff members and employees in that building who knew Kobe Bryant for two decades. Mm-hmm. And it goes on layer after layer after layer from top to bottom. I mean, let, let's just have Jeannie Buss, the, the controlling owner, she and Kobe Bryant are like brother and sisters. Rob Palenka, the general manager, was Kobe Bryant's longtime agent and best friend. Mm-hmm. They considered each other brothers and talked almost every day. Um, down to LeBron James, who the night when he passed Kobe on Saturday in Philadelphia, was absolutely blown away by he felt like, you know, the universe kind of saying something that he passed Kobe in Philadelphia, and he spoke for over 12 minutes of just what Kobe meant to him coming out of high school like Kobe, um, kind of idolizing Kobe. Kobe at one point giving him his shoes, and he wore those Adidas sneakers in a game, even though they were a size too small. Hmm. And so he just talked about, like, even now today, Kobe coming out to games and watching him with his daughter, um, LeBron said he was just blown away by that. And he couldn't have been more eloquent and more, like, grateful for Kobe Bryant. And this was all before everything happened. And now you fast forward to this game. The, the Clippers, for example, they played on Sunday hours after finding out that Kobe had passed. And Doc Rivers was in tears. And he was like, I don't know what to say to my team mm-hmm. before, before this game to get them to play this game. And then after the game, he told the media the players – didn't want to open the locker room to the player, to the media. They requested that, but they just weren't ready to talk about it. And Lou Williams, who played with Kobe, um, basically was like, I can't stop crying. This is on Monday, thinking about all the stories about Kobe Bryant. That was the opposing team that was supposed to play the Lakers on Tuesday. Hmm. I just felt like both teams were not ready to play, let alone the Lakers. Do you sense that it might be even longer than one game that the organization's uh, – the organization – will not want to be able to get back onto the court? They'll they'll play Friday. Um, you know, I think their next game is against Portland on Friday. Mm-hmm. But by no means it, are they going to be able to get over this in one, two, five, ten games. I think this is going to be a season-long thing. You, you've you seen the outpouring of reaction from around the league. Yeah. Like today, Brooklyn Spencer Dinwiddie said he's going to change his number from number eight to number 26 in honor of Kobe. And, and Kevin Durant came out and talked today, things like that. But for the Lakers, they are impacted directly. They're, I mean, you can multiply whatever everybody else is feeling uh, by – so many more, 10 times more, 100 times more, whatever it may be, because the Lakers are directly affected, like I said, from top to bottom. I mean, like, I, I can't even imagine what Jeannie Buss and, and Rob Palenka and, the, you know, Kurt Rambis and Linda Rambis, all those people are, are going through right now who, who knew Kobe and were so close to Kobe. I think they're kind of like trying to follow the lead of Vanessa and the Bryant family of what to do and how to, like, pay tribute and everything else. Um, and one other thing to touch on what you asked earlier, that you were surprised this game was postponed. The NBA told me that only 14 previous times, at least they believe, hmm. since 1963, has a game been postponed, not due to weather or not due to technical issues, really around maybe a tragic event like JFK's assassination or MLK's assassination or the Boston Marathon bombings. There's only been 14 other times pretty much since 1963 that a game has been canceled to something like that, or wow. postponed, sorry. It's unbelievable. Uh, we're talking with Om Young Misik. He covers both L.A. basketball teams, NBA basketball teams for ESPN, also covers the NBA. Used to cover the Nets, right, uh, Om? When you, when you covered the Nets, they played the Lakers in the finals, and that was uh, one of Kobe's championship teams. Yeah, Kobe and Shaq dominated right. the Nets uh, and beat them, swept them in four games. I also got to uh, see a cover a part of the um, Kobe's first championship, uh, or one of the Kobe championship when they beat um, Indiana. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, kind of been there along the steps. I mean, I, I was there in 1999. Um, I'm dating myself a little bit when they all, 1998, when the All Star game was at Madison Square Garden. And the 19 year old Kobe Bryant was the youngest All Star at that point. Uh, and he was booted in by the fans. And he decided to pretty much take on Michael Jordan on his own. Mm-hmm. And it was unbelievable. Uh, George Carl ended up, I think, benching Kobe in that fourth quarter because the veterans were upset. Kobe was waving off screens from Carl Malone because he just wanted to go ISO and go at Michael. And uh, But we all kind of knew then that this brash young kid 
um, was special. Uh, I even remember there was one reporter who, who you know, the media is not supposed to ask for autographs and everything like that. But I remember there was one reporter who did go up to Kobe Bryant and ask for an autograph because I, I think a lot of us kind of knew what we were seeing and what was coming. Yeah, one of the things that we were talking about today, uh, and you almost feel cheated or robbed because unlike some basketball players, oh, uh, great ones, who kind of struggle when the, the game is, is passed and they retire, figuring out what to do, it seems like with him winning the Oscar, him coaching his daughters, his advocacy for the women in sports, it seems like the best of Kobe off the field was yet to come. Is that something that you felt, you know, being out there in L.A. and covering the Lakers and seeing what he was doing in his post-NBA life? The, the tragedy of this, and, and we can't forget the, you know, the, um, the other people who died in the helicopter crash. Absolutely. For sure, there were many families broken and, and impacted by this. But, you know, look, if Kobe Bryant did nothing else after he retired, nothing else. Mm -hmm. um, it, it still would have a massive impact around the world. But because he won an Oscar for like basically his short film document, or the short film that he did um, right out of retirement, mm -hmm. because he had his hands in so many different things and was looking forward to the next chapter of his life and dominating it and attacking it the same way he did as a player. And because of what he was doing with his daughter and coaching her and what he saw in her and how he kind of like, you know, was was raising this little mambasita mm -hmm. to basically go play basketball at UConn and potentially the WNBA and their relationship. That's just what I think takes this to a whole nother level. Um, I think that's where everybody in Los Angeles kind of like believes they think of Kobe as their own, much like Philadelphia thinks of Allen Iverson as their own. Mm -hmm. But then when you add all those other layers, it just impacts everyone around the world. I mean, in China, Kobe Bryant was massive. And there are people mourning there. In the Philippines, there are people mourning there. Italy, um, because he, he had, you know, he had a life there as well. And he spoke Italian. I mean, it's just all over the world. And I think any father uh, can relate to what happened with Kobe and his daughter, too. It's just impacting everyone on, on so many different levels. Yeah, we're talking with Om Young Mies. It covers the Lakers and the Clippers and the NBA for ESPN. So you dated yourself earlier. So don't blame me for asking this question. But I think it's a relative one. Um, you go back to Magic Johnson in 91, I believe, announcing that he had the HIV virus and the way that sent shockwaves through the NBA community. Do you feel like this has even trumped that as far as its impact? And maybe it's a lot of that is social media and 24-7 and coverage of everything, but do you feel like it's the same magnitude right now in how it's impacting people involved in the NBA, fans of the NBA, media? At the time, I thought when it happened... I thought I'll never forget this much like I'll never forget where I was when Magic made his announcement. Mm -hmm. And for for those of us that were around then, um, it certainly felt the same way because at that time there were a lot of people that just didn't know enough about AIDS and HIV and you thought it was a death sentence for Magic Johnson. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, I guess in a way many people thought, oh my God, Magic Johnson's going to die. But in this case, this was such a shock of Kobe Bryant, we just saw him a couple of weeks ago, at, you know, at Staples Center, um, watching Luka Doncic, you know, hugging LeBron James. We just saw him at the Barclays Center um, with Gigi, and in, in that moment that went viral online. But I think this one has a has probably a greater impact because of social media, because of um, his brand that kind of went international and how he was able to connect to so many players. If Magic Johnson had probably played in today's era, then it would probably be, you know, probably the same. But I think this is, is in the last few days that I've watched and watched the news and everything else, and with all that's available to us now, it probably is uh, bigger than Magic Johnson because at least Magic is still alive, you know. Yeah. And, and, and and I went to the David Stern celebration um uh, about a week and a half ago, I think it was about a week ago, where Magic delivered an unbelievable speech on uh, how David Stern was his angel and helped basically save his life by standing by him and allowing him to play in that all-star game. But 
um, you know, this one is, is such a tragedy because we lost Kobe Bryant, we lost his daughter, and all the other people on board that helicopter. Yeah, you mentioned his daughter, and I don't think a lot of people even realize until the last 24 to 48 hours how good at basketball she was. I know that uh, she had a dream to go to UConn. I don't know how many people knew that. And it seemed like, based on some of the stories we've read, Ohm, that it was not just a dream, but this was something that very well could have happened and that she had big aspirations of being a pro basketball player. And we talked about on the show yesterday. I mean, we've seen a lot of father-son combinations, whether it's the Griffies, uh, whether it's the Mannings, right? Uh, we've seen that, but we've never really seen, in my, I can't think of any father-daughter kind of, obviously they wouldn't have played together, but just that kind of lineage. And it seems like this could have been that we're, that they, the Bryants, and we as a society will not. We almost get robbed of seeing something special in that regard. Is is she that good? Was she regarded that way? I don't know how good she would have been, um, but I just based on the lineage and her being like her dad, it seemed like, and her really, you know, pursuing this. I certainly felt like, and I'm sure a lot of people felt this way, that nothing was going to stop her. Uh -huh. And um, I think that is. For me, um, watching the, the last game when they aired it the other day when, when Kobe scored 60, you start smiling because you watch all these moments and you're just like, God, Kobe was ridiculous. But then they would pan away to his family and you would see Gigi smiling at him and the way she looked up to him, and it was just heartbreaking. And I think, like, I don't know how other, what other people are feeling, but certainly I think for myself, like, you feel moments where you watch – all this stuff about Kobe and you hear all these stories and you're just like, God, the guy was amazing. But uh -huh. then you see the shots of him and his daughter and that's when it just, just is gut wrenching. And I think for me, and I think for probably a lot of people, we saw what Kobe did and we celebrate him and everything he was and the Mamba mentality. But what we, you know, what, what is actually just so hard to hope with was what she could have been. And what she had her whole life ahead of her mm -hmm. and for it to end like this so quickly, I think that is um, something that a lot of people are having a hard time wrapping their minds around. Oh, and we really appreciate you joining us, man. I know it's not an easy story to cover. I know it's not easy being around the L.A. area right now with everything going on. So we definitely appreciate you coming on and giving us a few minutes of your perspective on uh, what life is like now for L.A. Lakers fans and the community and obviously the Bryant. So thanks so much, man. All right, thanks for having me. All right, Om. That's Om Young Misik. Again, he covers the Lakers and the Clippers and the NBA for ESPN. Uh, he's worked there for a while. You can find him on Twitter, at Notorious OHM. It's a little bit of a homage to the Notorious B.I.G. I know Om and I are big uh, 90s old school hip hop fans. And uh, Om's been covering the NBA for a long time. I met him when he was covering the Nets, uh, I believe, for the Daily News or the Post. Now my memory is starting to fade uh, I was doing a little bit of Nets coverage for the Gannett Papers in North Jersey, Asbury Park Press, Courier News, uh, all the Gannett Papers. I was the backup guy, so I got to meet home doing there. And those were some interesting Nets teams. Obviously, the the Jason Kidd, team, Byron Scott, another Laker, kind of connected here to the Nets. Uh, Byron Scott was the coach. Um, Lawrence Frank after that, Lawrence right? Frank after that. Yeah, I was there for that kind of, you know, Jason Kidd and Byron Scott didn't get along real well. Which is well, the story and, of Byron Scott. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much the story of Byron. Jason Collins was the center. Uh, he later would come out as a uh, gay a gay uh, Vince NBA Carter player. would come in halfway through I that run. I was gone before. You were gone by yeah, Vince I Carter? I wasn't there. It was more Kerry Kittles, Jason Kendall Kidd, Gill then. Kenyon Martin. Kendall Gill was not on that team. Like, yeah, he was a transit. Kerry Kittles would eventually take over. Keith Van Horn would come Keith aboard. Van Horn. Uh, and, and they then would leave. Go to, yeah, <laughs> and then they would go to two straight NBA finals. So yeah. uh, Alonzo Mourning on that. I was there. I covered a practice where Alonzo Mourning and Kenyon Martin had to be separated because Martin and Richard, Jeff Richard Jefferson mm. were kind of mocking Alonzo for, remember, he had gone through, like, these kidney transplants. Right. And, you know, these were, like, the young guys, and he was the old guy, and they, he couldn't keep up in practice the way he used to because he was coming back from that. And they were kind of getting under his skin, and they nearly came to fisticuffs, and that was a big, big story that day. I was there for that. And you know me, I was I only covered a few practices that was kind of, crazy just just to bring it full circle you mentioned kenyon martin uh-huh kenyon martin's kid goes to high school out in la right is does doesn't he play on the, the same school as sierra, sierra canyon yeah man everything ties in this nets it's all it's all uh, net, net, netted together net, they use the pun <laughs> interwoven um netted together i thought one of the things that you and ohm brought up i thought that was very interesting was the fact that 
look, that whole area, as he said, seems like they are just they're they're not handling it very well at all. Right. You know, it's not just the players, not just the team, it's the whole city. And right. I thought it was interesting because, you know, when we think about athletes who pass away, you know, usually it's an older athlete. It's not someone still in the prime of their life. Like mm -hmm. they might not be in their career anymore, but they're still in the prime of life. You know, your early forties is not old right. by any means. And I think that is one of the things I think it's overlooked in this is that it's not just it's Kobe, it's his age. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, you and Ohm talked about that. The fact that, you know, the city is looking at like, look at this dad, look at his daughter, you know, a, a 41 year old man and a, uh, a 13 year old young girl. I mean, th this is, this isn't supposed to happen. And I that's think right. that's what makes the, the, this, the level that it is. Also in fairness is we don't have a Kobe Bryant here. Uh, we don't have enough championships. We don't have someone who's brought four or five to the city. We've had some great players, some MVPs like Iverson, like uh, Steve Carlton, um, you know, Cole Hamels was a world series MVP, but nobody who's brought a dynasty to the city, maybe since the Eagles in the 60s, right? And Chuck Bednarik is not someone that a lot of people have even, know, like, ever seen play. He's just, a, he's almost a ghost to a lot of people. So that's another thing that if that were ever to happen here, we would probably have the same type of several-day-long grieving period for an athlete of that kind of caliber to happen here.